Hello everyone and welcome back. In a previous video, I provided an overview of how web APIs work. At a high level, a client like a web browser or a program or you as a programmer makes an HTTP request to a server which has an API listening for requests. If this is what's called an HTTP GET request, then the client's requesting some data. The server validates the request, grabs the data from its database or another server, and packages up the data in a response. And that response is sent back to the client. Typically, when using a web API, the response is of the format called JSON, J-S-O-N, JavaScript Object Notation, which is really just a dictionary. So if you work with dictionaries in Python before, then you're well equipped to start working with parsing the data you want from a JSON object you get back as a response from a server. The goal of the video today is to go through two examples of how to use an API as a client. And then in a future video, I'm gonna show you how you can set an API up as a server. So I have open here in VS Code a directory called API Client Fun, and I've got a blank Python file called itunessearch.py. In a previous video, I went through the different parts of an iTunes search API request where I was searching for all the movies in the iTunes database that have the word Thor in them. I could have chose any search word I wanted. I just chose Thor because Marvel movies are awesome, Thor is awesome, and Thor is a pretty short word. It gives back five movie results at the time of this video. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to use that URL to make a request to the iTunes search API, get a response back and parse out some information about the movies, the Thor movies from the response. We'll do that all in Python, starting with this blank iTunes search.py. So first at the top, I'm going to import two libraries to help me do this. The first is called the request library. And as the name implies, this is a library used for making HTTP requests. The second library I'm going to import is called JSON. So as the name of this library <laughs> implies, uh, JSON is used for working with JSON or JavaScript object notation objects. It'll be useful for us to take a string that we get back from a server, from our API request, and use that string to get a dictionary, like a Python dictionary, that we can start parsing. All right, you may need to pip install these two libraries. Uh, they are not standard libraries. Requests, for example, uh, you will need to pip install. All right, next I'm going to have a string called URL that is going to store my URL, which represents my request to the iTunes search API. So I have the iTunes search API open here. And what's nice about the iTunes search API for our first foray into working with APIs is it has nice documentation on how to use the API. So it says to search for content uh, from a field in your website and display the results in your website, you must create a search field that passes a fully qualified URL content request to the iTunes store. Parse the JSON format return from the search and display the results in your website. We aren't going to be grabbing fields from websites or displaying results in websites but this is how iTunes imagines that you, the programmer, is going to use their iTunes search API. You're gonna have a website where the user's gonna enter in some value in a field. You're gonna use that to parameterize your request to iTunes. iTunes is gonna give you a response back. You're gonna parse that response and you're gonna show the results of that response to the user on your website. All right, next, the fully qualified URL must have the following format. HTTPS, this is the colon, iTunes at apple.com. This is the subdomain, iTunes, and the domain, apple.com. And then slash search, this is the path to the search endpoint in the API. And then question mark, this starts what's called the query string, where we have an ampersand, listed, ampersand separated list of key value pairs. So it says where parameter key value can be one or more parameter key value pairs indicating the details of your query. So what's also really nice about this documentation is Apple tells you how to format your parameter key value. 
Okay, so it says you must concatenate each parameter key with an equal sign and a value string. For example, key one equal value one. You must concatenate each pair using an ampersand. And then here's an example. We can scroll down in the documentation in order to see what are the possible keys that we can provide as part of our query string. Okay, so here's a nice table with the keys and what the values for those keys can be. So term, this is the URL encoded text string you want to search for, for example, Jack Johnson. If your search term has a space in it, you should replace that space with a plus sign because spaces are not valid characters in URLs. Okay, the second key that I'm gonna use in my search is the media key. And it says the media type you want to search for. For example, movie. The default is all. And then you can see in the far right column, all of the different values I can pass in for the key media. So if I only wanna search for the Thor movies, Thor is going to be the value of my term key and movie is gonna be the value of my media key. So let's construct this query. Here's my base URL right here. After my question mark, I have my query string. I'll have term equals Thor, or you can put whatever movie search term you wanna put in here. Just remember, if your search term has spaces, you should replace each space with a plus sign. Ampersand media equals movie. This is the same URL that in a previous video I used as an example of an HTTP GET request and I showed all the different parts of the URL. You can copy and paste this URL into your favorite web browser and press enter. It'll give you a JSON response back, which you can take a look at. That's an example of using an API where the client is a web browser. Now we're gonna do an example of an API where the client is Python. All right, so our goal is to get a response back from a get request using the request library. I'll do dot get in order to make a get request, meaning I wanna get some data back from this server. Okay, the server is going to be identified by this URL, okay, itunes.apple.com. The path on the server to the endpoint where I'm making my request is slash search. And then here are the parameters for my search. Get, G-E-T, is not the only type of HTTP request. Just for uh, showing you some additional resources for you to learn about APIs and HTTP requests, I've got documentation from Mozilla Developer up on my screen right now. It says, HTTP defines a set of request methods to indicate the desired action to be performed for a given resource. And you can see there's not too long of a list here, but a list nevertheless of all the different types of HTTP requests. We're making a GET request. So it is not a coincidence that the function I'm calling from the request library is called GET. It's called GET because we're making an HTTP GET request. It says the GET method requests a representation of the specified resource. Requests using GET should only retrieve data. And that's what we're trying to do. So I'll paste this URL here in this Python code as a reference for why we're making a GET request. We are trying to get data from an API. All right, next. The first thing we should do is check the responses status code. If you've ever worked with C or C++ programs or Java programs, you're very used to writing a main function that reads something like int main return zero. Well, the return zero part is denoting a status code of whether this program executed gracefully or if something wrong happened. So when a program is started from the operating system, perhaps from command line, that return code is sent back to what we call the starting process or the calling process in order to determine if everything in that program went successfully or not. That analogy is parallel to a status code that a server sends back when you make a request. So for example, if I make a request to this URL, but perhaps I've spelled media or movie wrong, or maybe I'm trying to make a request to an endpoint that doesn't exist. Well, in that case, something's gonna go wrong. 
And we can check the response's status code in order to see, did everything go smoothly or did something go wrong? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to print out the status code. So that's response.statuscode. And now I'm going to run this. All right, the response I get back is status code 200. So what does status code 200 mean? In my browser, I have also got the Mozilla developer docs open to HTTP response status codes. So it says HTTP response status codes indicate whether a specified HTTP request has been successfully completed. Responses are grouped in five classes. And here are the five classes. Since I got a response of 200 back, I see that successful responses correspond to the range 200 to 299 for status codes. In fact, I can go look and see specifically under the successful responses status codes, what does a 200 mean? And a 200 from a server means okay. The request has succeeded. So this is awesome. Specifically for a GET request, it means the resource has been fetched and is transmitted in the message body. Okay, so the resource that we want is that JSON response, and I know now it's in the message body. So I've got to figure out how to get the message body from the response. Well, thankfully, the request library makes this really easy, and we can grab the message body from the response simply by using the text attribute. So once again, I'm going to copy this URL and put it right next to the code in my Python script that uses the status codes. So if response.statusCode is equal to 200, this means success. And I can grab the JSON object from the message body. Okay, so the message body is available from the response. So response.text, this is going to give you the message body in a string format. But I want to get my message body in JSON format, which is represented in Python as a dictionary. So I can do this pretty easily with the JSON library that we imported on line number two. So I'm gonna have a variable called JSON object and it is going to be assigned the return value from json.loads response.txt. So json.loads accepts a string and returns a dictionary. So json object on line 15 is a dictionary. I'm gonna print it out. So here's the output. It's actually pretty big. Let's scroll up to the top. All right, so here's the status code 200. Here's the output. There's a curly bracket, which we know is used to denote dictionaries in Python. And then I've got two key value pairs in this dictionary. Result count, which has value five, and results, which has this really, really, really big list here. This whole thing is the same list. As you can probably guess from the result count being equal to five, there are five elements in this results list. One for each of the Thor movies that match my request. So let's take a look at the first one. So it says wrapper type track, kind feature, mu feature movie, collection ID, track ID, artist name, collection name, track name. I'm gonna stop here for a second. Track name maps to the value Thor. This is the name of the movie, Thor. Okay, so if we iterate through each object in this results list and we extract from it, okay, remember the object is a dictionary, you can see the curly bracket here, and we extract from it its track name, we should be able to get the name of all five of these movies in the results array. So let's try it. So results array. I could also call this results list. In Python, it's a list, but since our list is actually a representation of JSON, in JSON, you would call a list an array. 
So results array or results list, either name is perfectly fitting. So I'm gonna index into this dictionary at results. And then I'm going to iterate through each result in result array. Okay, so for example, the first result is this guy right here. Let's see if I can find the ending of it. I believe that's it right there. That whole JSON object right there, that whole dictionary corresponds to the first result in result array. Okay, now I wanna grab the name of the movie. So I'm gonna index into this dictionary at track name, and I'm going to print out the name. Let's see how that looks. There we go. We knew there were five results in the results array based on that first keys value in the JSON object response. And we index into each object in the list in the array, got its track name and printed it out. So we've got Thor, Thor Ragnarok, Thor the Dark World, Thor Tales of Asgard, and I am Thor. Awesome. So this is a great first example of working with an API for lots of reasons. First, the iTunes search API is unauthenticated, which means I don't need an API key in order to make a request to the API. Secondly, the documentation, uh, though it's in the archive here, you can see documentation archive, it's very well written and it actually helps teach you how to use an API. Lastly, the response back is pretty easy to extract what we're looking for. Although this JSON object looks pretty big, it's pretty manageable to work with because there's not a lot of levels of nesting. We were able to grab the name of each movie with only two indexes into the JSON object, one to get the results array, and then one to get an object, uh, excuse me, one to get uh, the track name from an object as we iterate through each element in the results array. All right. Something fun for you to try, I'll leave it for you as a task, is to try and extract the movie time in hours. And I'll even say in hours and minutes uh, to be a little more precise. So for example, if a movie is say one hour and 34 minutes, then you should, you should show output one hour and 34 minutes. Okay, you'll have to look at all of the keys that a result object has, try to find one related to how long the movie runs, and you might need to do a little bit of arithmetic in order to convert that time into hours and minutes. All right, this concludes my first demo that I wanted to do with you for how to use an API. The API we used, just to recap, was the iTunes Search API from Apple. The next API that I want to use as a client is actually an API that I created. It's a pretty simple API, but it's a fun one because it's related to data science and machine learning. In another video, I'm going to show you how I made the API. So if you're interested in how to work with APIs from the server side, not just the client side, uh, that'll be a really fun video for you to watch. And we're going to lay the groundwork now for that by using the API as a client. So let me give you a little bit of background on the API that I created. I've got a nice little interview tree here. If you've worked with decision trees before, uh, you'll be well equipped to understand this example. So a decision tree is used to make predictions. So for example, here I have a decision tree that has leaf nodes related to true or false. So is a decision tree used for binary classification where given someone's information about their interview for a job, did they interview well, true, or did they interview poorly, which would be false. So for example, if you've got a person in their mid-career, they're very likely to interview well. Uh, let's say you have someone who's a junior level or entry level in their career 
and they don't have a PhD, then they're going to interview well. That's pretty much the basics of how to use decision trees to make predictions. Given values of different attributes, you follow the tree until you get to a leaf node. The label of the leaf node is the class prediction for this unseen instance. I don't have a source for this data set, but I will show you the original data set that was used to construct this tree. So this was the original X training data, and then here's the parallel list of labels Y train. So X train and Y train, as well as the domains of the attributes were used in order to generate the tree that I just showed you. All right. I have a representation of that nice PDF tree in Python using this nested list structure. So what I've done is I've essentially built an API that has this nested list representation of a tree and accepts values for these four attributes, level, language, tweets, and PhD, and it returns a prediction, true or false, whether someone with these attribute values interviewed well or not. Now, the goal of this video is not to teach decision trees, machine learning, or binary classification. The goal of this video is to show you how to use an API as a client. So this is just background information on the API that I created. It's essentially a deployment of this little tree here that can be used to get predictions from the tree. The tree ultimately represents a trained machine learning model that is deployed so that it can be used for predictions on unseen data. All right, hopefully that's enough background to be dangerous. Let's head back over to VS Code and copy all the code we wrote for the iTunes search. It's going to be pretty applicable for our next demo, which I'm going to call interviewpredictor.py. I'm going to delete everything below printing the JSON object. That's when we started parsing the JSON object whose format is going to be really specific to the iTunes search API. All right, let me scroll up here and make a little note. So I created an API that is hosted as a Heroku app. If you've never heard of Heroku, no worries. In this video, you don't need to know anything about Heroku. Just know that it's essentially a backend as a service that I'm using as a cloud provider to host my API. So the API accepts four key value pairs, one for each of those attributes I showed you for that interview table. So the level of the candidate, are they junior, mid, or senior in their career? The language they used when they interviewed, Java, Python, or R, whether they are active on tw uh, Twitter or not, yes or no, and whether they have a PhD or not, yes or no. Given values for these four attributes, the API returns a prediction of whether the candidate interviewed well, which would be a true, or not, which would be a false. And it uses that decision tree in order to make these predictions. So our goal is to make a request to my API in our query string, pass in key value pairs for level language tweets and PhD, get a JSON response back and parse the prediction out of the JSON response. This is kind of a nice preview of how you can deploy a machine learning model. We're just using this tiny little data set here to get us started. Hopefully you can see the bigger picture, which would be for something a little more interesting, probably a larger data set than this, how could you deploy a trained machine learning model and then use it from clients like Python, Google Chrome, uh, an iOS app, another web app, etc., to make predictions that you can use in those apps. All right, so first things first, I've got to give you the URL for my app. I'll note that this URL 
uh, corresponds to what's called a free dino on Heroku. So if it doesn't have any activity within 30 minutes, it's going to go to sleep. So if this doesn't work the first time, just try it again a little bit later. Uh, making those requests will wake up the dino and it'll start responding. I also can't guarantee that in the future, I'll still have this little app deployed. Uh, so this demo may be something that you just follow along with listening instead of follow along with coding in case a few years from now, maybe I don't have this app still up and running. All right, here's the URL interview-flask-app.com, or excuse me, .herokuapp.com. Okay, so the subdomain is interview flask app, the domain is herokuapp.com. The endpoint is predict. We start the query string with a question mark. For level, let's pass in junior, ampersand to separate this key value pair from my next one. For language, let's say Java, ampersand. For tweets, let's say yes, ampersand. And for PhD, let's say no. That's it, I make a request and I get this tiny little JSON response back, which is the prediction is true. If we take a look at the tree, If a candidate is junior, we go down this branch of our tree. If the candidate does not have a PhD, then the prediction is true. Just to make sure that everything's working, let's say we make a request again. This time, instead of PhD being no, we set PhD to be yes, then our deployed model should return false because our deployed model is a representation of this tree. Let's try it. So now I run it again and I get prediction equal to false. Awesome. So it looks like we are able to get predictions from this small deployed decision tree model. But like I said, you can imagine deploying a much larger, much more useful uh, trained, say decision tree model or naive Bayes model or neural network or whatnot uh, that would give you a little more interesting predictions that you might use in your client apps. All right, if we want to get the actual prediction out, it's going to be pretty straightforward to do so. I'm going to simply index into this dictionary using the prediction key. And then I'll print out the prediction. And just like that, I've got the prediction. All right, hopefully this provided uh, two fun examples of how to start working with APIs as clients. The first one, uh, we were using an existing API from Apple iTunes to search its database for some movies. The second one, we were using an API that I created as kind of a stepping stone to how can we deploy a trained machine learning model and use it to make predictions from client apps. If you found this second example interesting, I encourage you to watch my next video, which is going to be, how did I build this? Okay. So stay tuned for that and thanks for watching.